Hello, hello everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, whatever time it is you're watching this, or maybe even good night or good evening. It is Mr. Moray here with a video on exponential models, and I'm doing today for you a little crash course in the modeling itself. So, so far this year, we have taken a look at a lot of stuff. It's been some year, right? And some of that has included exponential functions um, and properties of exponents and everything that we have now come to know as things involved with having X in the exponent. We've seen that some functions are always increasing or growing and some functions are always decreasing or decaying, right? Now we know that functions have this quote unquote invisible line that they get really close to that horizontal asymptote. And we know that sometimes the graphs are above the asymptote and sometimes we're below the asymptote. So today we're going to actually take a look at some um, scenarios and situations, contexts involving exponential models. And in these, because of the nature of the context, we're going to assume that the y values or the outputs of our, of our model are always going to be positive. So as you see here, and so we're going to define exponential growth as any such model where the y values increase as x increases, as you see in the blue. And we're going to in, uh, define decay to be when the y values decrease as x increases, okay? And the words exponential growth and exponential decay are pretty commonly used. Um, we'll take a look at some words that will key you in to whether it's growth or decay. And then we'll look at a few scenarios where I actually show you how to set up and execute on that model. For this video, you are gonna have wanna have access to a graphing calculator. If not, um, you can have access to Desmos's scientific calculator. And you can find that by going to www.desmos.com slash scientific. Okay, that will take you right there. All right, so let's jump into it. So when we think about growth, we think about the Y values growing. Um, sometimes you'll see the word appreciating. Sometimes you'll see gaining value or increasing. They're going to be words telling you that whatever it is that we're trying to model is going to be, the values of it are going to be going up. And again, we're going to see some specific val as a, like examples of that. Decay on the other hand, okay, think about if you don't brush your teeth. This is the example I often use. What's gonna happen to your teeth? Your teeth are going to decay, right? They're gonna start to wear away. The, the amount of tooth you have is going to decrease. Also notice that decrease starts with DE, decay starts with DE. So decay, decrease. Okay, so that is a, is a situation where we that we'd want to examine there. And so some words we think about would be shrinking, depreciating, or de to depreciate. And to, to depreciate just means to lose value. It's another word for losing value or decreasing. Okay, so those are some words that you'd want to think about. Okay, so some steps to success whenever you're going to work on a modeling problem involving an exponential function. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to identify the type of problem. And so you're going to want to know, is this an example of growth or is this an example of decay? And really you need to have read the problem. So I guess we could almost say in this case, uh, we have a so-called step zero, which is read the problem, right? Because until you read the problem, you're not going to know what kind of problem it is. So we're going to read the problem. We're going to identify the type of problem. We're going to set up the type of exponential model we need. And so we're going to take a look at when it's growth versus decay, what does that entail? We're going to plug in whatever needed values we need to solve. So for example, what will be the value or how much of these will exist or how much of these will be left after X number of years or X number of days, it, you know, we ha we'll have to really dive into the situation to know that will be our, our last step to actually get the answer. 
once we have the model. And so step three, this is where we're going to need to have some form of calculator to really assist you in seeing success. And actually that's what I'm doing right now. I'm taking out my TI-84 calculator, okay? So that I can have that with me. And during these videos, or these problems, I will also have my calculator simulator open so that you can see what um, things that you could be typing in to help you solve the problem. All right, so as you can see, I've got my calculator now open and ready, and here we go. So here's our first problem. So what I'm gonna most, mostly do in this video is I'm gonna do problems where I'll do them. I'll show you how we set them up, how we really get after it. Then I'm gonna ask you to help me do some problems, and then I'm gonna actually try to have one for you to try as well, okay? And then we'll also have plenty of time in class to talk about it. Again, part of the goal is to just make this video so you have access to really making sure you understand this important idea, um, but you can do it kind of at your own pace. All right, so a 1970 comic book originally sold for 35 cents has appreciated at 10% per year. What will be what will it be worth in 2020? Round to the nearest cent. Okay, so a lot to unpack here. So first of all, some things that I noticed. First of all, I noticed the word appreciating at 10% per year. I noticed that it, it, it originally sold for 35 cents, but also, and this is something that people uh, don't always notice, the fact that our reference point, our beginning point is 1970. So what that means is that if I plug, and some people use T in their model, I'm gonna use X in my model as my independent variable. It doesn't really matter in terms of your final answer. It's just T stands for time, so that's why people like to use T. So when X is in zero, X equal to zero, we're gonna think we're in the year 1970. It's been zero years since 1970. It's gonna make our model a whole lot easier. Y needs to be equal to 30, uh, 35 cents. And then also when X is equal to, now how many years is 2020 from 1970? Well, it's 50 years later. And this is really why we need a calculator to do this for us. We actually wanna know what is Y. Okay, so that's some other important information. All right, have, knowing that we need to round to the nearest cent, I'll put that squiggly because that's a little bit of supporting detail. And then I always like to underline my question because whether we're in a test for Mr. Murray or a quiz for Mr. Murray or you're on the SAT, one of the big things that you want to always make sure you do is you always want to answer the question that's being asked. And that's a place where maybe not me, but other people like again, SAT, they'll really try to trip you up is getting you in a situation where you've done so much work. There we go. There's the answer, but you didn't actually answer what was being asked. And it's really unfortunate that they do that, but it unfortunately it does get a lot of people. All right. So let's think about this conceptually. So the book appreciates at 10% per year. So what that means is every year it has 10% more value than it had the last year. So for example, in 1971, okay, it's going to have 100% of the value that it had in 1970 plus an additional 10% in new value, okay? So it's gonna have 100% of its 1970 value plus 10% of its new value. And then in 1972, you're gonna see the same thing. It's gonna have 100% of the value it had from its 1971 plus an additional 10% of new value. And this is going to continue to happen, right? Every year, it's going to have 100% of the value it had from the year before, plus 10 more percent of new value. Now, let's see if we can figure this out. So that means that it has 110% of the value 
that it had before. So actually, believe it or not, what we're really looking at is, if we think about it, a geometric sequence where each term represents the value of that comic book as we go from year to year. Now, you might remember that every geometric sequence, when you write its explicit rule, right, uh, has what we call the common ratio. And the common ratio is what this 110% that is, is essentially representing. However, you can't just directly plug a percent into an equation because percents are generally designed to make numbers look nicer, but you cannot directly compute with them. You need to turn them into a decimal because that is the system of numbers we're working in the decimal. So we got to make this into a decimal. So 110% as a decimal is 1.1. In other words, it's 1 from the 100% plus 0.1 from that additional 10%. Okay, that's where that comes from. And now we have a ratio that we're going to use. Okay, so right now where I'm at is I have, let me just get a good color for this. I have my function. You could even write y instead of f of x. It's probably fine. So remember, I have an a value. And then I now have my, my b or my r value. 1.1. And another way to know how to find the 1.1, if you want to convert a percent to a decimal, as you're going to see from over here, you're just going to take that percent. You're going to divide by 100. Because what does percent mean? It means out of 100, per 100. So when you see the percent, just take that percent sign, replace it with divided by 100. Now you're back into a decimal. All right. Now the next thing I know is that when I plug in, now this is where this comes in. When I plug in zero to represent 1970, I need to get 0.35, 35 cents. So that is to say, if f of x equals 35, a, or that is x, the input is equal to zero. And I'm just gonna highlight, so, the input is zero. The output is 35 cents. And this is interesting because we know that anything to the power of zero is one. So really what that means is since a times one, that's just the same thing as a, a equals 35 cents. So basically what that means in this scenario is whatever that initial value is, we can plug that right in for a. So we get f of x equals 35 cents. This is the 110% per, per year times x. And so you might ask, why am I, why the idea of why I'm putting the exponent on the 1.1? And the reason is because every year, you're going to be getting 110% of what you had the previous year. So in 1971, you have 35 times that 110%. But then when you're going to 1972, basically you're taking that 0.35 times the 110% and you're multiplying that by 110%. And then in 1973, you're taking what you had in 1972, remember like this idea of like a recursive rule, and you're multiplying that by 1.1, 110%. So you see what we're doing here? Every year, we're multiplying by 110%. But if you think about it, the order with which you do multiplication and the way you group it doesn't matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to regroup it so that 1.1s are together. And because of what we know about what exponents mean, this is 1.1 to the power of 3. So I just wanted to really show you in detail where is that coming from. Okay, You can see how this looks just like this model up here. 
but now actually plugged in. Okay, so last step, we now need to know in year 50, in 2020, what's going on. So when x equals 50, what is happening? So to find that out, we're going to take f of x, or rather f of 50 would be more mathematically precise. f of 50, and that's equal to our 35 cents that we started with. And so if we think about it in year 50, we'll multiply by one. Think about like if you look at 1973, it'll be uh, the 35 cents times 1.1 times 1.1 times 1.1, 1.1 over and over again, 50 times. So 1.1 to the power of 50. Now think about 1.1 to the power of 50. As it is, we probably don't want to really do any decimal to the power of 50, any whole number. Now imagine a decimal, that's why you're going to use your calculator. So we're going to do 35 cents times in parentheses 1.1 now to do an exponent in the desmos graphing calculator i believe uh there's a button that you want to look for i believe it says like a to the power of b something like that look look for something where you've got variables for both you don't want to do x to the power of a or like there's one with it has like x and then something's a the power um, you could probably do that too just look for something that, that does the exponentiation okay so here I'm going to do my exponent, but I'm actually going to click on the right thing. Back to my sign to my graphing calculator to the power of 50. What you should get is 41. It's about equal to 41 and we need to round to the nearest cent. 09. All right, so now I'm going to go on for one uh, that we are going to do together. So as we go through, I'm going to ask you some questions and I hope you can chime in to help me out. And I'm actually going to change the wording up. Um, what I want to know is because this is a tricky one, I'm going to ask, what is it worth for years? from now okay that'll be our question so what is it worth now what's our starting point okay our starting point is two thousand five hundred dollars is this an example of growth or decay this is decay because we see the word depreciating depreciating by how much 12 percent per year Okay, and what do we want to maybe round to the nearest dollar? All right, so let's look at the setup. So when X is equal to zero, Y is going to be equal to what? Based on our situation, it's going to be worth 2,500. That's what it's worth now. All right, so let's say now is 2021. 2021, it's worth 2,500. In 2022, it will have 100% of the value that it had in 2021, but now it is going to lose value. It's going to lose value. So how much value will it have lost? It's going to have lost 12% of that value that it had, leaving us with how many percent? 88%. In other words, as a decimal, that would be 0.88, or one minus, one for the hundred, minus 12 hundredths for the 12%. So you can see if you're depreciating, you're going to take that rate, you're going to subtract it from one. Whereas if we're increasing in value, you're going to take that rate and add it because add makes ma making values go up. Think about subtract, taking away, right? The value is being taken away. Now, here's the question. Will the value ever hit zero? And we should know the answer to that is no, right? And that's from contextual perspective, the right, that idea of horizontal asymptote. Sure, after enough time, the value is going to be worth almost nothing, but it will never 
hit likely hit actually zero dollars and zero cents okay though at some point it might be worthless to ryan um we'd like to think because of that asymptote it will never actually get to zero my apologies for showing that other one there all right so basically we now need to set up our situation all right into a function so what we're going to do we're going to do f of x so we're going to jump right into plugging in that initial value so the initial value is what 2500 okay because when x equals zero we want to have 2500 as our answer and because we're doing the power of zero that's what's going to happen our rate is 88% and again you have to do that as a decimal one of the biggest mistakes people do is they drop the 88 in there and here's how you're going to know you're wrong we're going to see how you're going to know in a minute if you do it the wrong way okay and then you put an x because if you have a function of x there needs to be an x you have to have somewhere to plug into all right now we want to know how much is it worth how many years from now four so what number are we going to plug in for x we're going to plug in four so 2500 times 88 percent to the power of four and we're going to do that in our calculator 2500 88 88 power of four and that is going to be worth to the nearest dollar one thousand four hundred and ninety nine dollars so notice how depreciating losing value fourteen hundred ninety nine is less than 2500 and that's what you should expect all right now i thought i'd show you guys what's going to happen when you do something that many many people do very well intentioned and they plug in 88 instead what's going to happen is you're going to see a number like this so if you do 2500 times 88 to the power of four what you end up with is one four nine let's see one four nine nine so you end up with, I'll, I'll literally write it out. So you end up with something like one, four, nine, nine, two, three, eight, four, zero, 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 zero. So um, hundreds, thousands, millions. So you're saying that this is worth $149 billion then that doesn't make sense. This number is bigger than what you started with. It's also unrealistically big. I've never found a car that's worth $150 billion, let alone a motorbike. So what you got to ask yourself, this is one sign that you have the wrong answer or you entered something wrong. If it's supposed to be incre increasing in value, your answer should be bigger than where you started. If it's supposed to be decreasing in value, your answer needs to be less than where you started. So if that's not the case, nine times out of 10, it's the rate that is not right because the initial value is being copied directly out of the problem. So as long as you copied that down correctly, it's kind of unlikely that it's going to be wrong. Okay, so our final answer, 1,499. Again, I just wanted to show you, though, what that looks like. All right, here's another one uh, for us to do. I'm going to do this as a we do problem. So a bank account starts with $100 and earns 4% interest annually. How much money will be in the account after 12 years, assuming no transactions have occurred? Round to the nearest cent. 4% actually is extremely generous. You're almost never going to see a savings or checking account especially a checking account you're never going to see it growing at four percent interest annually um because I, you know to be honest right the, the whole point of the bank is they're going to take your money and invest it and they really want to invest your money and unfortunately if you think about what's the bank's goal it's to make money so they're going to want to give you as little as possible for letting you use their money or borrow their money to invest okay so that being said um one is this an example 
of growth or decay. This is an example of growth. Your money is growing. If you're putting your money in the bank and you're losing money, you shouldn't be in with that bank. Okay. So it starts with how much money it starts with a hundred dollars. So that's the beginning. And we want to know how much ha has happened after 12 years. The reason it says assuming no transactions have occurred means because if we took out money or we deposited money or put money in, that's going to affect the answer to the question. And it's going to make it way more complicated. So we're saying we leave the money in there just like Fry when he took his thousand year nap. We left the money in there. We didn't do anything with it. Okay. That's really, really important to think about. So that being said, let's see if we can figure out some information. So first of all, when X is equal to zero at the very beginning, Y needs to be equal to how much money? $100 because that's how much we started with. Okay. Now let's talk about our rate. So to find our rate, we're going to take the hundred percent each year that we started with. And are we going to add to it or are we going to subtract from it? We're going to add to it because we want to be growing. We want to be earning. When we see earn, that's a sign of growth, right? Having more. So how much are we adding each year? We're adding 4%. Also another mistake people make is they write the percent wrong. If you do 1.4, that's like 40%, right? Or 0.4 that is would be 40%, right? And again, the, the one represents the hundred percent you started with. The four represents the 4% you gain each year. If you'd rather write it as a percent first, then convert it into a decimal by just dividing by a hundred, that's totally fine. So that means the rate we're gonna use is 1.04, which corresponds to 104%. All right, let's bring our let's bring our stuff together. What's that going to look like? F of x equals first, we're going to write what our starting value of 100. Then in parentheses, we're going to write what one point or one and four hundredths and then up here, our X. There's our model. Now, what is our X value going to be? We want to know how much money is going to be in there after how many years? After 12 years. And this is more or less a simplified version of the uh, notion of compounding interest, um, where you don't calculate the interest annually, maybe you can calculate it every month and you want to know what's going to be in there after 12 years. So another thing you could take a look at is, so what they do is they take that 4%, they divide it into 12 and then they add on that 12% uh, or that, that, that four divided by 12. Um, that is every single month instead of doing the 4% once per year. Okay. And that's a whole nother discussion, but, um, it's, this is like, like kind of related to that problem. So we have a hundred, 1.04 or one and four hundredths to the 12. And that is the money that we get after 12 years. We get about $160. We want to round to the nearest cent. So, and 10 cents is what we'd put in there as our final answer um, for this problem. And hopefully it makes sense how we got this one set up. Again, you're just reading off from your problem. You're taking your values and plugging it in. And there you go. All right, guys. So last question, this one's going to be a you try. Okay. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to try this. So here's the situation. Suppose the number of COVID-19 patients in Delhi is increasing day by day at a rate of 16% per day, which was initially 25. Then which of the following is the closest value to the number of COVID patients per week? So I guess we should fix this up a little bit because this was originally a multiple choice and we're going to ask what. 
So again, we have the number of COVID-19 deaths in Delhi. It's increasing day by day. It's increasing at a rate of 16% per day. We know that there was initially 25 cases. So what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video. I want you to create an exponential model. I want you to use that to determine what is the number of COVID patients after one week. Think about how many days that is. And then when you're ready, unpause the video and you can see what I got. All right, everyone, let's take a look at this. So our exponential model should be this. So we start with 25 patients. We're increasing at a rate of 100%. So every day we have 100% of the people we had the previous day, plus an additional 16%. And that would simplify as, and you don't have to do the one plus as long as you can get to one and 16 hundredths to the power of X. As long as you can get to this point right here, you're in good shape. Now I wanna know how many patients after a week. So I'm gonna plug in 25, I'm gonna have my one and 16 hundredths, and then I'm gonna have X equal to seven, 25, one and 16 and 16 hundredths to the power of seven. That's going to be after one week, there are gonna be about 71 patients. Okay, you would wanna round it to the nearest whole number. There's no such thing as a partial patient. You can have part of a person in this context. So I would say and you'd, you'd wanna round to the nearest whole number. So 71 patients. All right, hopefully that made sense. If not, go ahead and rewind. And actually, I have one more bonus you try problem to check out. All right, guys, this is a bonus you try problem. So in the 2020, where we, we're, we're beginning, so we're beginning in 2020, um, and actually, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reverse these. So I'm going to say in 2017, in the beginning, the fish population was 26,244. Okay. And it is declining by 10% per year. What is the fish population in 2021? And basically in the beginning. So basically in 2017, the fish population was 26,244 and it's been declining by 10% per year. What is going to be the population in the beginning of 2021? And don't focus too much on the word beginning. All it means is that we're going to go exactly four years. Because if I say, well, if I'm midway through the year, we know, well, we're not going to be right? We're still going to be in the process of losing that 10%. So we're just keeping the time frames relative. Again, don't worry about the beginning. It's not going to have any impact on your function or your answer. So what we'll do again, let's pause the video. We're going to try to determine the number of fish in 2021 based on this information here, then go we'll unpause and see what I got. Okay, so let's start with our model. So we started with 26,244 fish. We know that we're losing 10% of our fish per year. So we should end up with something like 26,244. And then if we go four years out, we'll plug in our four. So our answer is 26,244 times 0 0.9 to the fourth or 17,000, about 219 fish. So folks, hopefully you found this video to be helpful. Keep it up, folks. Um, let me know if you got any questions. Always happy to help out, help out. Don't forget to love math. Have a wonderful day. And remember that you can do it. Take care, everyone. And I'll see you next time.